Welcome, everybody, to this evening. My name is Sue Doster, and I'm going to be the moderator here this evening. The format of the evening will be as follows. First, we're going to hear from Heritage of Pride, New York City Pride, to be followed by the NYPD, to be followed by the mayor's office, and then followed up by Goal, the Gay Officers Action League. After that, we will have time to hear from you. We will open the floor for questions and answers, and we will ask that so everyone can be heard. We just have one person speaking at a time. So with that, we are gonna get underway. Thank you all very much for coming. And I will introduce Heritage of Pride, Marianne and Julian, thank you. I guess I'll be starting. I thought Julian was, was kicking it off. Are you kicking it off? Perfect. So I'm Mary Ann Roberto Fine. I'm one of the co-chairs for Heritage of Pride. And I just wanted to let you know a little bit about who we are. For those who don't know, Heritage of Pride is a nonprofit membership organization. We have about 77 members. We have 15 executive board members. And we employ 10 full-time staff with additional seasonal staff during our busiest time of year. Our members commit a great deal of time and energy to attending meetings, planning, staffing our events. Members are just like anybody else in this room. We're people who have other lives, other things that we do, and we come together to make something happen. And membership is open to everyone and anyone. Every June, we are joined by about 1,000 more volunteers who help make our events possible. This year, directly or in partnership with other organizations, we will be hosting a total of 19 events between June 14th and June 24th. We do tr try our best to be transparent. Our meetings are open to the public. We have a calendar of meetings that is available for anyone to see. And if you're interested in any of the events or activities that we are working on, you are more than welcome to join us. In addition to producing events, we're committed to supporting the LGBTQIA plus community. We are on track to provide more than $125,000 this year alone, giving back to smaller nonprofit organizations who provide vital services to our community. Throughout the year, our members and volunteers also provide hundreds of hours of volunteer work. We have built houses alongside Habitat for Humanity. We have served meals at SAGE and GMHC. We have planted trees in the Bronx. We have handed out thousands of pounds of fresh produce at food banks. Uh, we even have provided for uh, support for other organizations' events, whether it's staffing the door, helping the event happen, whatever it is that we can do to lend a hand, we show up, we're there. So several years ago, Heritage of Pride won a bid pr bidding process to host World Pride here in New York City. We've been working hard on that ever since. And we are working to prepare for what is expected to be the largest LGBTQIA plus event to happen. We expect to welcome up to 5 million people to New York City for Stonewall 50 and World Pride 2019. We continue to need the support of our members, our volunteers, our community partners in order to make that happen. And that, in a nutshell, is just a little bit about us. Thanks, Marianne. Um, hi, everybody. I am Julian, I'm the Pride Match Director for New York City Pride. Um, I've got a presentation slide presented, so um, I'm sorry if you can't really see me, but I'm just gonna navigate this while seated from here. Um, so as many of you are already aware, we've made a change to the March route. Um, so on the left is the March route for 2017. <coughs> And on the right is the March route for 2018. So the March route for 2018, 
We'll be starting. We'll be starting um, at 16th Street and 7th Avenue, and we'll move down the ADA past the ADA seating on 12th Street and 7th Avenue in front of the AIDS Memorial Park. Um, go straight down uh, past the broadcast booth, which will be at 7th and Christopher. Turn left onto Christopher past the Stonewall. Uh, move on straight to West 8th and turn left onto 5th Avenue all the way up to Dispersal, which is going to be at 29th Street and 5th Avenue. So that's how the route is going to look this year. So a little bit about the formation area. The formation area is going to be between um, 15th Street to 19th Street from 9th Avenue to um, 7th Avenue. So this is where most of the staging, the, the staging area would be for those groups that will be stepping off. Um, dispersal area. So the dispersal area this year, as I mentioned earlier, dispersal will be from 29th Street. Um, we've got a larger footprint this year to um, accommodate the floats, the vehicles, um, and also the larger vehicles that we have. Um, over the years, we have, in, we have seen an increase in all of these vehicles, and we see that we need a larger footprint to accommodate all of this. So between 32nd Street, 29th to 32nd Street, you will we'll have the dispersal area this year. All right, so um, I know a lot of you are probably wondering why. Why the change for the route? So these are a few reasons. Uh, these are the top five reasons. First, we have, you know, this is in preparation for World Pride, which is uh, next year, as you know, 2019. And we are also having Stonewall, uh, 50th anniversary of the Stonewall riots. Number two, we, it's the impact on the area itself. Um, and I'm going to talk about each one of this a little later. I've got a slide for each one of this to explain why. Um, Number three, ease of dispersal and transportation options. Number four, improving stakeholder experience. And finally, safety. So let's look at the first one in preparation for World Pride. So um, NYC Pride, we are marketing pretty heavily. We'll, uh, we're marketing at World Pride, not only just here in, in, in New York State, but we also are heavily marketing all over the United States. Um, in, in parts of Europe. So we are anticipating over about 5 million people. On average, we get about 2.5 million right now. So we anticipate the, the, the numbers would actually double next year. Sorry, don't know what that was about. Okay. Um, so we have also moved, uh, we have a few other events that we organize. Uh, we do the Pride Island, we have Pride Fest, these are some of our major events. We've moved those. So Pride Island this year will be at Pier 97, which is near Hell's Kitchen. Pride Fest is going to be moving to University Place, which is on the eastern side of the island. Um, so given all of this, we also needed to make sure that we're able to do a trial run in 2018 prior to the event in 2019. So um, as I mentioned earlier, if you can look at um, the slide on your screen right now, you'll see that Pride Island is to the north, Pier 97. This is where the march is, the formation area, or the staging area comes down, goes all the way up to dispersal, and this is where the Pride Fest is going to be at University Place this year. So the impact of the area. So given that we have the route this year, plan the way it is, um, and also the fact that we are anticipating almost 5 million people coming into World Pride, we need to look at how that will impact the area. So in, 20, in 2017, the march followed a longer portion of Christopher Street. Um, as many of you know, that portion, especially after Stonewall, it gets narrower, and it gets narrower as it gets to Greenwich. Um, with a new route, the march will pass along wider avenues, and, along, and this will allow for more spectators um, for, and this, of course, would help with the overcrowding of the sidewalks. So if you look at the map at the bottom, um, the sidewalks are about seven feet along Christopher. Now, we are looking at about 16 feet in terms of width when, when you're talking about the avenues, the seventh avenue as we walk down. So that obviously can accommodate a lot more spectators. Um, in addition to that, um, if you look at as I mentioned earlier, as we get closer to Green, uh, Greenwich Avenue in last year's route, 
Um, the, the street actually gets a little narrower. From, it starts at 28, about 28 to 29 feet, and it gets a little narrower to 26 feet. And so that creates a bottleneck. And so that's also a huge challenge in comparison to the avenue itself. We are looking at almost about 70 feet in width. Then ease of dispersal. So with the newer, um, the newer route and the newer dispersal area, um, dispersal will be meant, uh, it will be at Fifth Avenue between 29th and 32nd Street. From this location, there'll be a much larger number of transportation options, and I got a map for that. I'll talk a little bit more about that. This allows for easier crowd dispersal and accessibility to various locations throughout the city. Um, so for dispersal, as many of you know, um, right now, 29th Street to 33rd Street, that's pretty much where the dispersal will be on Fifth Avenue. Um, you have a lot more options in terms of transportation. For instance, Grand Central is pretty close by. We have a lot more subway stations, 33rd Street, 28th Street. We've got Penn Station, 33rd Street, um, and 42nd Street is just not too far from um, the dispersal area. So there's a lot, there are a lot more transportation options compared to what we had in 2017. In 2017, there are barely any transportation options. You're looking at um, Christopher Street stop, and it's a little challenging for people to get back if you're coming down, and dispersal was at Greenwich. And packed, sometimes it's closed, so it's also a huge challenge in terms of transportation. So um, that was definitely something that we needed to consider. Now, given the fact that we have all of these transportation options in 2019, with the different events in the different parts of the island, it's a lot easier for people to, tra uh, to be able to travel to these locations. They'd be able to take the train to get off to, um, to, pr uh, to get to Pier, 7, Pier 97, they can walk down to uh, the Pride Fest. There are a lot of folks who don't want to party in Manhattan either. Um, let's also keep in mind the different demographics we have to work with. Um, in, in terms of people of color, there are a lot more people of color who may want to go to Jackson Heights to party. There are people who may want to go to Williamsburg or Hell's <coughs> Kitchen to party, not just the village. So that gives them a lot more options and that will definitely ease the overcrowding in the West Village and be able to help with crowd distribution all around the island. So improving stakeholder experience. Um, last year the march took <coughs> almost nine and a half hours, a little longer than that. It finished at 9.38 p.m. Um, we have a lot of volunteers and vendors who also have to be able to help us run this event. This year we are looking at about 800 volunteers. We have a lot of float providers, we have AV people helping us out, we have tons of different vendors that we work with to make this event run. Um, a lot of them do show up at 4.30 in the morning, 4.30 or 5 o'clock in the morning. Last year when it finished at 9.38 p.m., we had a lot of them go back home at only about 11 or 12, uh, you know, at midnight. So it was a lot more challenging there. Some of us had to stay on until <coughs> one, two o'clock in the morning. So it's definitely a huge challenge, and we're trying to reduce that. Um, also, keep in mind, the change of route means there's, you know, a lot of the groups at the end start marching in the dark. And that's a huge challenge. This year, there are a bunch of different groups that I was speaking to who are towards the end of the march who, didn't, who, were really cha who, were, who felt a little challenged that they were at the end because they were concerned about marching in the dark. And that's also something that we have to keep in mind. Um, so we hope that we are able to keep, in, you know, keep all of this in mind and try to cut down the, um, uh, the duration of the march to hopefully under nine hours. That's also why we're introducing a limit to the number of marchers per group. We had to have wristbands so that we're able to monitor that. And also, hopefully, the route will help. So in terms of safety, there are a lot of safety, uh, there are a few more sa additional safety measures that can be um, put into place because of the new route. I'm not going to get into that details. So NYPD will be able to do that since they're here. Um, let's talk about how we came about making this decision. Now, we started talking internally because of World Pride. We knew about World Pride a few years ago, and we, need, we, dis we knew that we would need to do additional planning given the numbers that we were expecting. So in December 2016, we started internal discussions about how we want to accommodate those, those numbers. Um, so be between December to February, we had a lot of different meetings internally, and our committee meetings are public, and so are our gen uh, general membership meetings, where a lot of this open discussions were uh, taking place. 
with those information and with different proposals, we had another discussion with NYPD where, you know, because we had applied for permit through NYPD, uh, we talked about some of these uh, options in August. And between September and December, uh, there was a lot of back and forth between NYPD and a few other agencies, agencies and ourselves to develop the final uh, proposal. And on January 22nd, we finalized the route based on a meeting that we all had. Um, there were a lot of different city agencies who were there in, uh, during this meeting. You didn't consult the community. Where was the community? Um, I'm sorry. I'm going to be presenting guys, this right now. I, I do, hold on, hold on. We will have a time to hear your feedback. I'm going to ask you to hold questions and comments to the end. We will make sure everyone is heard. One person talking at a time. Let Julian finish his presentation, please. Thanks, sir. All right, so there are a lot of different city agencies that we had to work with um, from NYC Parks, um, Parks and Recreation, <coughs> SABO, um, not just NYPD. So a lot of different, in, di all, all of these different agencies were involved in making this decision. There are also a couple of community boards that were consulted um, before we finalized on, on the route. So that's pretty much uh, my presentation, uh, just to cover some of the reasons why we had to change the route and what are the decision-making process, that, uh, how it looked like. I'm just going to pass it next to Sue to introduce the next speaker. Actually, I'm going to hand it over to the NYPD to self-introduce to you guys. We have four speakers from the NYPD. And then, as I said, we'll be hearing from the mayor's office and then go. Thank you. It's OK. Good evening, everyone. Can you see me or no? Or should I stand up? Is it better? Yeah. All right, thank you. I am Detective Carl Locke. I am the LGTBQ liaison for the police commissioner. I've had this position for not quite a year yet. But I do have 17 years with the NYPD. Before I was with the NYPD, uh, I was a social worker in the city. I worked at the Gay Men's Health Crisis for many years, then I worked at the David Geffen Center for HIV Testing. Before that, I mean, and after that, I worked at the Gay Lesbian Anti-Violence Project. Uh, I considered myself a social worker, an activist. I never thought I would be a police officer. But my work really at AVP and doing victim service work and interacting with members of GOAL and different members of the police department and a couple cases that we focused on made me realize I felt for me, I did what I could on the outside, I needed to do something on the inside. I needed to try to join the NYPD, see what it was like, see if they could deal with me as an out gay man. And never did I think 17 years later I would be here, but I am. So uh, in this current position, I have the ability to, to go around the city, to meet as many people as I can. Many of you, I recognize your faces, whether it's at rallies or protests or or different community meetings I've been to. If I haven't met you, I will hopefully get to meet you. Um, I take my job very seriously. I look at the department with a critical eye. I also look at it as someone who's been on the outside, who's ran a police misconduct program for the queer community, and now someone who is on the inside. And I think I have a unique perspective on policing and policing the queer community. I do my best to make the department rise to, to be the best department that it can. I, I am proud of the department. I also know there's a lot of better things that they can do. I know policing large events is complicated. We have some people here who are helpfully going to explain some of that complication to you. I have heard community concerns. Trust me, I've talked to some of you individually, some of you as a group. I've brought those concerns back. I had meetings with the commissioner, with his executive staff. I've tried to explain some of these dynamics in the, in the best way that I could. And I know I don't have all of the answers. So I'm here for every single one of you. You can reach me through email. It's carl, C-A-R-L dot lock, L-O-C-K-E at nypd.org. I have business cards. I want to hear your concerns. I want to hear your complaints. And if there's anything good, I want to hear that too, right? But my job is to help make this department better and to do it from the perspectives that I can. They gave me this job knowing who I am and what I do and how I see the world. And uh, I don't think my bosses are upset they gave me the job yet. So. I think uh, I'm doing a good job. So I want you to know that this position is here for you, for the community. I do want to hear your concerns. And part of my mission is I'm supposed to take individual issues or community issues and look at how the department can translate that into policy. 
And I have done that in the last 11 months. I have made recommendations, and, uh, and some of them have been listened to. So that's who I am. That's what my role is in the NYPD. If you didn't know who I am, now you do know, and I'm available. You can reach me pretty much any time, seven days a week. If it's too late, I get back to you the next day, but uh, that's what I do. So we do have some, some executives here. We're going to have the Assistant Chief Pichardo from Chief of Patrol Office. He's going to speak to you. I have Deputy Chief Galucci from Counterterrorism who's going to be here to speak to you, and Deputy Chief Kehoe from the Borough of Manhattan South. These are three areas in the department that are responsible for policing large-scale events, and they have a lot of information, and some of their staff are here to share with you. So I encourage you to take a minute to listen to them, and then I encourage you to ask questions. So thank you for your time. My name is De Deputy Chief James Theo. I'm the Executive Officer of Patrol Bar Manhattan South, and I'm in charge of special events. And I'm looking forward to hearing your questions. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Assistant Chief Fausto Pichardo, and I'm the Executive Officer of the Patrol Services Bureau in the New York City Police Department. And to put that in perspective, the Patrol Services Bureau oversees all 77 police precincts in the whole city of New York. So first, I'd like to say thank you. Uh, thank you for taking the time to come here tonight to hear our thoughts, voice your concern, share ideas, because the paradigm shift in this organization and this agency is one where we're constantly looking to engage the community to better ourselves as an agency. So with that being said, <coughs> Uh, I will pass the mic off to the Chief uh, Galucci, and anything that you have, hopefully I'll be able to answer any of your questions, but I'll close my brief a uh, few words saying thank you again for affording us as an agency, especially for the Chief Patrol's office, an opportunity to be here with you this evening. Thank you, Chief. Uh, again, I'm uh, Deputy Chief Joseph Galucci. I'm the Commanding <laughs> Officer of the Citywide <coughs> Counterterrorism Unit, and uh, basically my responsibility is to uh, uh, put together the uh, uh, the blueprint for the counterterrorism overlay for any uh, large scale event or uh, mass gathering. Uh, and what I can tell you right now, uh, before we take some questions, would be that uh, as of this time, there are no specific uh, threats toward this year's uh, event. But uh, you know, however, you know, the march is taking uh, taking place amid a, a heightened global threat environment and uh, during a period of numerous international domestic incidents targeting. Uh, all types of communities, including uh, LGBT. Uh, so we're out there to, uh, you know, we're in the process of putting a, our plan together to uh, keep the event safe, keep the, uh, the participants safe, keep uh, anyone attending the event safe, and uh, again, you know, take any questions in regards to that. All right, and before we move on, I do want to recognize that another, a number of other police officers are in the room to lend support. Do you guys want to stand up and be recognized? They're already standing in the back. <laughs> Moving on to the mayor's office. Thank you, Sue. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name's uh, Matthew McMorrow. My pronouns are he, him, his, um, and I am from the mayor's office. Uh, so I want to thank. Sorry. Sorry about that. Um, so as I was saying, my name is Matthew McMorrow. I want to thank the NYPD, Heritage of Pride, uh, the public for coming out tonight, um, just to have this conversation about what's going to happen this year and sort of recommit to a an even broader conversation going into the World Pride next year. Uh, Mayor de Blasio and uh, First Lady Shirley McRae are very excited about Pride Month. Um, New York City is the birthplace of the LGBT rights movement. Um, and so for some pride, uh, you know, pride is an opportunity to celebrate our identities and to be together. Um, for others, it's a time to recommit ourselves to the struggle for equality and justice. And for many of us, it's, it's really both. And I think there's room for both uh, in, this, uh, in this march. Um, we just have to be respectful and mindful of each other's uh, you know, goals. Um, the mayor and the first lady stand with our community both in celebration and in resistance. Now this evening we've heard from the NYPD and HOP about the changes that are going to be made 
for this year's march. And I know that HOP is looking forward and ahead to World Pride, where we're expecting two to three million more people. And this year we're, is meant to be a trial run. Uh, and some of the changes meant to make the experience enjoyable for everyone. Um, but obviously it's going to be a work in progress. After this year, we're going to meet together, meet with the community, meet with NYPD, and come up with and identify things that worked and things that didn't work so that we can all work together to make next year an even more successful uh, march for everyone. Um, so I look forward to having any questions you may have about the process and the details. Um, the truth of the matter is we are, you know, we went through a process, um, we're a few weeks away and we're open to hearing more about uh, your ideas. Thank you. And now we'll hear from the Gay Officers Action League, Goal. Good evening, my name is Brian Downey and I am <laughs> the president of the Gay Officers Action League of New York, the first organization for criminal justice and law enforcement LGBTQ people in the uh, city, in the nation, and in the world. Uh, 36 years ago, uh, we were founded. Um, this happened after uh, Charlie Cochran, an NYPD sergeant, testified in favor of a New York City uh, gay rights bill in front of a city council in an open hearing in 1981, in November. Um, Shortly after that, Charlie worked with uh, several uh, people, uh, Sam Chacon uh, being one of the more significant visible ones, and they met in a church basement in, uh, in the village, um, not too far away from here, and uh, they founded the organization Goal in 1982. Now, the original purpose of Goal was to advocate for the rights of LGBTQ members of the criminal justice profession and assist on issues related to discrimination, harassment, and desperate treatment in the workplace. Our organization has since evolved. We also now provide LGBTQ sensitivity and awareness training for criminal justice practitioners, and we are available to consult with executive staffs on best workplace practices. Um, the final component of the work we do is probably the most complex of all. We try to work to build a bridge between the LGBTQ community and the criminal justice community. Um, some of our, our history, when we were first founded, the department uh, really didn't want us the NYPD. The majority of members were from the NYPD, although we're an organization that's comprised of many, many different agencies. So the first members who publicly identified um, or even thought to be gay uh, suffered violence and discrimination, threats against themselves, threats against loved ones, violence against themselves, and loved ones. Cops, at one point in history, lived in sheer terror of our own. I have always said that if that's how we treat one another, then how on earth are we treating the public? And I firmly believe that by coming into an agency, whether it's the NYPD, whether it's the state police, whether it's uh, you know, the New Jersey State Police, we have members from the FBI, um, that going into an agency with that unique experience, with that, um, I'd say, with that discrimination, with that, you know, just, just to highlight a, a couple of examples, we have people that are in goal now that when they were kids, they were on the Christopher Street Pier at Pride. We have members that were um, thrown out of their house for being gay and lesbian. We now have a handful of transgender police officers that bring that unique experience uh, to the job. So, for over 30 years, we fought tooth and nail to um, be recognized as equals. I would say at this point in time, we're tolerated. I don't know whether we're at full acceptance. Um, 
but we continue to put ourselves out there, continue to put ourselves on the proverbial chopping block uh, inside of these agencies. Some of our uh, accomplishments and things that we've worked on over the years are, um, well, first of all, we had to sue the NYPD to be recognized. We had to sue to get the same rights and respect that every other organization had. We sued to be able to march in uniform. And not only that, but there are a lot of organizations in the LGBTQ community that were part of that fight, okay? So we couldn't have a pride celebration at headquarters. We couldn't have the ability to do recruitment. We couldn't get department resources. So out of that lawsuit, we gained the same rights that the other groups had. We also were granted the right to do the training that we do at police recruits. We train every NYPD recruit in LGBTQ sensitivity and awareness. We've also worked to train Jersey City recruits. We've been, at this point, we've been approached by other nations to conduct sensitivity and awareness training with uh, their police so they can gain access or admission into institutions like uh, the UN or the European Union. Our training has been vetted. It has been presented to the top police brass in Mexico, and we are going to continue pushing forward with that training. Um, it's, it's one of the, the best things I think we do, and uh, I'm very proud of that work. And the curriculum was actually, the current curriculum that we're using was written by Carl, and he used his social work experience, his experience at AVP, his experience at Gay Men's Health Crisis. So, that's a very, very unique perspective. What we do by wearing those uniforms is, what we do by wearing the uniform is we force them to deal with us. Putting that uniform on is showing them that we're here, we're in numbers, we're not going away, and you are going to deal with us. So that's a little bit of our history. Um, and there's a lot of things that if, I'm sure if we spoke one-on-one, -on -one, I know I've spoken one-on-one -on -one with many of you, I know I know some of you. Um, there's a lot more that we agree on than we disagree on. And I'm here representing the Gay Officers Action League. I'm not here representing the NYPD. Um, in closing, I'd like to share a quote that was written by Charles Cochran um, that I think kind of plays true today. And uh, I, I think there's been some progress, but we're not done. But Charlie said, I will not stand before you and say that every cop in New York City is free from prejudice. I cannot deny your personal experiences. I'm not asking anyone to deny knowledge culled from personal experience or recorded history, nor am I asking that the past be forgotten. But for our sake, we must cease preoccupation with that which was and view the future as the road of concern. Thank you. And thank you to all of our panelists. Um, but now we want to hear from you. So anyone who has a question or a comment, Please start to line up at this microphone. Because there are so many people in the room and we have a set time when we have to be out of the center, we're going to limit questions, comments, and answers to two minutes each. We'll also ask if you have more than one question, wait until Others have asked their question, just so we can be fair and make sure we can hear from as many people as possible. One, 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 one question. Yes. Can you not go into the microphone? Certainly. Hi, my name is Carol Dimici. I have been marching for nearly 50 years from the day I came out when I was in my mid-20s. 
Um, <clears throat> with orange bed sore in Washington, Trump, we are being erased. We are being erased in our own community. We're being dismissed. Our rights are being eroded. If the police still don't accept the police in their midst, do you think they really accept us? No. There's a local democratic club here where I've been called a fucking dyke by a member of the board, and they call, he also calls the men fucking faggots. So this, and there's more and more of it because of orange bed sore. And we have always marched on Fifth Avenue, and I'll be damned that we're not going to do it. And we should be marching all the way up or all the way down Fifth Avenue, past St. Patrick's, we should be marching. <laughs> I didn't hide. And I lost family, friends, a lot of things. Because when I came out, it wasn't popular to be a lesbian. It wasn't popular to be a gay man. And when this man came out, when his, the founder of Gaul came out, what he had to do to, with the police department. Um, I mean, I could go on and on, but I only have a couple of minutes. I have a question, though. 57th Street is where you're having the pride... Um, uh, whatever you're having there, right? At the river? 57th Street, correct? Pier 97, yes. I'm sorry? It's Pier 97. And it's at 57th yes. Street. Well, I live there in the pyramid, that big building that's shaped like a pyramid. And how the hell are you going to get all these people there? Because you have to go to Columbus Circle to get a subway. And it's a long walk. Or... There are two buses that come up there, but you gotta go uptown to get those buses or wait for the 12 that only runs every half hour and on the weekends it's not running every half hour. So that's a big problem. Um, anyway, I'm gonna stop now and let other people talk. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes, okay. My name is Sherry Clemens. And my concern is Hop has not consulted with the rest of the community. Having a group where people can volunteer is not reaching out to stakeholders. We're all stakeholders, and I know you work hard. I've worked on Hop years before, and I understand going in early and coming out late and all of that. But you have to listen to the community, and that also means reaching out and engaging. These are major changes, and it escapes me why all of you, the mayor's office, everybody should have known that these changes would be disturbing. You should have had this meeting back in January. My name is Jim Forat. I'm 77 this month. I came out and came to New York City in 1961. I was on Christopher Street for four nights. I was in front of the bar. I know what actually happened as opposed to much of the myth making that's gone on. And I'm very disappointed, Heritage of Pride. And Julian, and I know the staff there works very hard. You have erased our history and you have participated in relationship to this police department, over-policing us for years. Sometimes with the help of elected officials that came from this community, and I'm talking about Christine Quinn. This plan is terrible. And I can't... I have a lot of respect for what you do. The Gay Liberation Front was born on the third night of the Stonewall Rebellion. We have been marching in the recent years with intergenerational group. And we will march again this year because we will not be erased from history. This movement was born in resistance and multi-issue politics. To the goal people, I remember when you started. I remember that it was a learning curve for me to th understand why gay and lesbian people would want to be cops. But I did. And I supported the right of someone to do that. But you are not playing the role that you should be playing in this. 
you should be with us and resisting this control. Two minutes is not enough time. I have a long legacy. I'm going to stop now, but this is not the way you do it with the community. Amen. Yes. Hi, so my name is Mary Ellen Novak. I, my pronouns are she, her. So you had mentioned as far as reaching out to the community, or there was some note about that in your slide, and a few of us don't know that. We didn't know that that happened. Um, it's questionable. So now, since this is going to be a, quote, trial run for next year, uh, I really think, and maybe everybody would agree with me, that we are going to be invited, we meaning the LGBTQAI population, to your debriefing meetings so that we can understand what you appreciated, what went wrong, all of those things. So you will invite us. Now, specifically, the ones that I can mention, and I'm sure others will also um, you know, come forward and let you know, but our Rise and Resist, Reclaim Pride, and Gaze Against Guns. So those um, populations will be attending your debriefing meetings as far as what you learned during this trial run. Um, before you leave, if you can give a tentative schedule as far as when that meeting is um, planned. And then also, what is the date when the 2019 permit discussions will begin? It looked again from one of those slides, maybe I didn't see it right, but that actually your discussions with the NYPD started back in the summer sometime, so you will invite the LGBTQAI population, not corporate representatives. So that's all I had to say. <laughs> Hi, you talked about safety. Um, I want to know why Pride continues to have barricades when up until the mid-90s, Pride did not have barricades. And barricades are safety risks. People trip over them. People can't uh, leave the sidewalk. I want to know why barricades continue to be happening when there are other events that happen in the city that don't have barricades. There are examples. Yeah, they are also, they're locked barricades. They're not like soft wooden ones where people can move and get out safely if they need to. And there are examples of worldwide events that happen that don't have barricades, such as um, Carnival in Brazil and other things around the world that don't have barricades and nothing happens there. So why do we have barricades and why are we being locked into cages? That's my question. I'll answer that. Uh, good evening, thank you for having us here. Uh, in Manhattan South, we probably do hundreds and hundreds of events, uh, whether they're demonstrations, pro or con, uh, immigration rallies, uh, anti-Trump rallies. We do uh, 30 major events, and I consider Pride being in the top four with uh, Fourth of July, New Year's Eve, as well as the Thanksgiving Day Parade, where we see well over two million people, uh, and the detail goes on for hours. We use barricades. It's a balancing act uh, between members of the community that are living in the community, businesses in the community, uh, tourists in the community, uh, participants in a, in a parade or a march, as well as spectators. We've used them for the Israeli Day Parade, for the St. Patrick's Day Parade. Uh, we use it, and it, it works for us. We haven't had any issues uh, as far as uh, major injuries, it keeps kind of like the pedestrian crossings, it keeps the flow of the parade or the march moving, uh, and it, it aids us in police and safely uh, large-scale events. Hi, I'm Jay, I use uh, he, him pronouns. Um, I, I'm here to talk a little bit about uh, the issues concerning race and policing in this city. Um, um, you know, Brian, I appreciated your saying that as a part of coming into goal, that bringing the perspective of a, of a gay person or of a lesbian person or now perhaps of a transgender person perhaps opens up more, more thought. I'm sure you as a Latino person can, can bring your, 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 your perspective to bear. But the issues that we're seeing in this city around the policing of black bodies um, directly impact on pride, directly impact on the way that black people in New York City feel welcome or unwelcome at Pride. Um, the fact that I belong to several activist organizations 
Um, and and as you well as 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 Brian and you and Carl both know, you you come out, you, you're there with with the police at our actions. Arrests are incredibly uncommon at rise and resist actions and gays against guns actions. They are incredibly common at Black Lives yep. Matter actions yep. when yep. the people that are being yep. arrested have yep. not committed a single violent act or done anything in violation of anything. Hawk Newsom was held for 24 hours the last time he was arrested. Mm -hmm. So this is an issue, and I, I'm bringing all that up. I have some, little, some lovely little handouts for you prepared by a law enforcement agency, namely the FBI. This report came out in 2006. It, it, um, it details the infiltration of law enforcement across this country by white supremacist organizations. I would like to hear at some point for the NYPD to, do, to say something publicly about this report. To my knowledge, the NYPD has never done anything to ferret these white supremacists out of the NYPD. And you know there have been people with, with major complaints, like Officer Pantaleo, that have had complaints for years before <coughs> he killed um, uh, before he killed in Staten Island. So I'm going to give these to you guys. And you guys My name is Scott Kaplan. I am the police misconduct and corruption officer of the Jim Owls Liberal Democratic Club, a multi-issue progressive citywide LGBT political club. Jim Owls and the club founder and president Alan Roscoff helped found the original march. Our club is boycott boycotting the march this year for the first time ever. And the founders, the original founders of Gay Activists Alliance are going to be announcing a boycott of next year's march. We think it's important to recognize the central purpose of Stonewall March. It's a, a statement against the police harassment that took place that led to this whole community. And it should be the community that decides this, not the NYPD. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Mark Milano. I, I don't know where to begin. I have so many problems with so many people on this panel. <laughs> All right, go. So I'm really happy that you have an employee association, but our question is, what have you done for us lately, right? What have you done for the gay and lesbian people of New York? Sensitivity training, I don't know if we see any increased sensitivity among New York City cops. I, I, I was a, a white guy in Chicago who never had a problem with the cops. I came to New York and I joined ACT UP. And I've been in so many protests and I've been treated like shit by New York, uh, New York City cops for 30 years. You guys beat us, you pepper spray us, you do everything imaginable to people who are engaging in nonviolent protests. So you, want, you may say you're a gay man, you're a cop to me. And I don't want you marching in uniform in my parade until I see an apology from the name of my PD. Not only for Stonewall, but for a hundred years of abuse of queer people and people of color. When, yeah. when, when you start changing the way you treat us, then maybe we'll be proud to have you in our parade. But until that point, I have no pride in seeing gay cops in the parade. For, for Hop, I think I have the biggest problem with you because you have rolled over for everything that the cops have asked for, right? They want to shorten the parade, you say yes. They want to change the rug, you say yes. They want us and the Puerto Ricans to wear wristbands, you say yes. They want barricades. I just spent the day at the Filipino parade last Sunday. There was open access at every single intersection to that parade. So why can't we do that? You are separating us from the march. The first thing I did as a gay man when I was 25 years old in Chicago and I was severely in the closet and petrified is at the end of the gay pride march, I stepped off on the sidewalk and my heart beating, I marched in that parade. When I came to New York, we used to chant, 
off the sidewalks into the streets. We can no longer do that because you're separating us. This is our parade. It's not your parade. And we are fucking sick and tired of you controlling it to death and letting corporate America take it over. Stop it. Hello, um, my name is Jeremiah Johnson. I'm with the Reclaim Pride Coalition. Um, and there, there's so much to echo in what's being said. I, this is a time for rebellion, if there was ever a time for rebellion. We, have, we are under attack on all sides just this week. The Supreme Court lessened our rights and, and increased the ability for people to discriminate against us. And so my concern is, is that there's a movement toward controlling us, toward confining us, toward killing that spirit of rebellion within this movement. And my concern is, is you know, you think that making something public is the same as community engagement. It's not. You have to intentionally do that. Yeah. <laughs> and I very much want to echo what Mary Ellen said about including us in that process. And where hard work is a good thing, if it's hard work in pursuit of the wrong aims, then it's not good for us. And my concern right now is that you guys are party planners with no sense of rebellion and no sense of the original spirit of Stonewall. And if you are not prepared to foster that spirit of rebellion, then Reclaim Pride Coalition is. And I encourage everyone to join us and be part of that discussion. But my real point here is for goal, and my question is for goal here. Um, in terms of racial disparities in New York, it's been horrific forever. Um, in 2010, 16% of the population in New York uh, was made up of black people. The prison population was 53%. Um, we've seen some improvements in time, but not because uh, the police are advocating for this or because the police unions are. Police unions continue to aggressively advocate to keep prisons open even though they're empty. And you continue to threaten BuzzFeed when they are trying to publish information about disciplinary action against officers who have been abusive to community members. And so my question for Goal is, is what are you doing? What initiatives are you doing for communities of color? Because it's more complex these days. We can't just advocate for ourselves. We have to advocate for the most marginalized people in our communities, not just the white gay men in our community. I want to hear about those initiatives, and then I can be more supportive. Hi, uh, so my name is Alex Leach. I'm also part of the Reclaim Pride Coalition, and I do have a few things to say. First of all, being that I appreciate your opportunity to take this as the moment to defend your organizations. However, the muffin making of HOP is not what we're interested in. The interests of being able to do sensitivity training for the NYPD is phenomenal, and I appreciate that effort. However, there are obvious and continuous problems about the way that you engage with the community. And to echo, as Jeremiah just said, making something public as different than seeking out the voices of the community of people that you are meant to be representing is tangible and obviously substantive in terms of the room full of people that have showed up tonight. So as we continue to go forward for World Pride that will be happening next year as the 50th anniversary of, as Jim said, the Stonewall Rebellion against the police abuse of the LGBTQ community, there absolutely needs to be a formal apology from the NYPD. There absolutely needs to be a formalized apology and acknowledgement from the office of the mayor. There absolutely needs to be the inclusion of the activist LGBTQ community in further planning as it goes forward. And HOP as organized may need to be reorganized with a community chair who is actually responsible for seeking out the voices and input of the community that you are meant to represent. Secondly, 
the slide that would show the accessibility of public transit that is a map with lines on it and statements about, and it's easy enough to walk from here to there, is one of the worst representations of like marginalization of the disabled community I have seen in years. Saying simply because you're in Midtown and that there is more transit available does not make it accessible. One of the first things I noticed tonight in being here at six o'clock to reserve a seat was incredibly emblematic of this process, which was a disabled person coming to the front to be able to have access to the microphone at their ease. And because Hop had neglected to reserve the seats in the front to keep for the support officers that they would like to have to show the brass that they have support, you were asking this woman to move from her chair in order to make it accessible to them. The disabled community did not have accessible, easily available seats reserved for them, but you tried to displace them to be able to instead put in supporters of the police who are not under threat here tonight, as much as they might feel that way. Thank you very much. My name is John Carter. My defining experience with the NYPD was being arrested by the NYPD. I was arrested, thrown up against a, sm a cement and tile wall, uh, and cuffed with a zip tie as hard as the officer could pull it, and dragged into holding. And was immediately told that the charges against me would not stand. They, they thought that they, that they weren't, weren't um, uh, applicable, and that I would have my, my um, record expunged uh, as soon as possible. Uh, I was also told that he mistook me for the, for the typical scum that he saw in Penn Station. Uh, that's my experience with, with, with the NYPD personally. I came out of that experience with, uh, of, of two minds. Uh, I know that it's an organization with, run by people uh, and staffed by people. And there are people that are good and bad in every organization. Uh, so I have mixed feelings about my sense of, of uh, safety and pride around the NYPD. I have heard from people in my community who have had worse experience than I have with the NYPD, who are terrified of your organization and see your uniform not as a source of pride, but as a source of, of, of real threat of danger. And I'm here in solidarity. <laughs> I am here in solidarity with those people uh, requesting that you consider their needs. There are people who are being actively excluded from this march who need to be there. There are activists who are why we're all, all here. They uh, fought for the drugs that people take to stay, stay sexually safe. They fought for our, our rights and, and your rights. And because of abuse they, they experienced throughout their careers as activists, they're terrified of your uniform. And they are requesting that you put that aside to, so they can be included. They're speaking out of true fear. The, people, the, the community of people of color in the queer community and the trans community also have people that are desperately afraid of your uniform. And they are asking you to put your, your uniform aside as solidarity with them and their, and their very true sense of threat. People, people that are uh, uh, disabled and uh, need to leave the parade route mid-route are not able to do so. There's no, that is not a porous border. And People who are disabled are invited to watch the parade, but some of them are desperate to march in the parade and able to march in the parade. But you're telling them that if they are fatigued or tired and have, have a health crisis in the middle of the parade, that they are committed to finishing the entire route and are able to leave. And that's totally inappropriate. And it excludes yet another important, vulnerable part of our community. Uh, I, 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 I feel I'm, I'm almost done. I, I feel like um, uh, the disabled, queer people of color, trans people, and activists are the reason that we're all here, the reason that pride happens. They, <laughs> they must be included in the day in a place of honor and without any obstructions to their, their participation.
Hi, I'm Ashton Gizi with Outright Action International, and I deal with uh, folks uh, around the world who would love to be in a room right now where they're <clears throat> um, in front of police speaking their mind. Uh, so I just wanted to know who who directed the the plan. It was it. HOP, or was it the police who directed the new parade route? Good question. Who chose it? Yeah. We'll take, we'll answer this after. Hi there, my name is Hannah Simpson. I'm a transgender woman. I'm working with Hop on the info booths this year, but I'm speaking, of course, as myself tonight. So I just want to say, first of all, that uh, I was not alive during Stonewall, and maybe that gives me, as you probably guessed, that gives me a different perspective on some of these things. And what I can say is that I've interacted with the NYPD on many levels myself, including sitting in on a hate crimes investigation, supporting a trans woman of color friend of mine. And uh, what I can say is that uh, what you don't hear about in the news are thousands of officers who are saving lives and respecting us, uh, getting us help instead of throwing the book at us, sometimes in ways that if they could report that, those officers too would not have jobs again. And uh, I just want to remind the crowd that when we as a queer community uh, keep teaching ourselves in the echo chamber that this notion that we are not entitled to the same civil services and municipal authorities as our cis counterparts are entitled to and our straight counterparts are entitled to, that we're just reinforcing the same prejudices that keep us different from another. And I'm just proud to say that we have queer officers, we have transgender officers, firefighters, paramedics, and I'm just excited that you're here and I just want that to be said by somebody. We, we have a long group of people that are speaking. Please refrain from interrupting the speakers. Thank you. Okay, I'm Natalie James, and I'm with uh, the Reclaim Pride. Uh, I'm Natalie James. I'm with Reclaim Pride Coalition, as well as with the Democratic Socialists of America. Um, I have a, an ask directly to Goal. Um, I, I'm asking you to follow up on some of the comments, and, and I'm sure... Um, you know, moving accounts of, of systemic racism enacted by the police here in New York. I'm asking you to follow the lead of the Minneapolis goal and march without your uniform. In <laughs> Minneapolis goal responded directly to the community after the murder of Fasil Castile. And we have, we have recently had the, the, the murder of Saheed Vassal in Crown Heights, and I'm asking you to respect that, that the, the community, and I'm asking you to do the right thing. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jake Tolan, he, him. I, uh, I guess I am probably the catalyst for the Reclaim Pride Coalition, so sorry about it. Um, <laughs> but my question is mostly regarding the wristbands. Um, I think for pride, for a lot of people, uh, it is their first experience of being able to be openly gay. For New York City, a lot of us, uh, it really is a place we come as refugees, whether or not that is because we are literally fleeing our countries because they are uh, murdering gay people, whether they're just a kid out on, on Long Island whose parents don't understand. I grew up in central Pennsylvania where people tried to run me off the road where I was sexually assaulted in high school and my principal made me apologize for it. <laughs> and then I came to New York City as actually my first Pride Parade and it was amazing. And I, I didn't know anybody, I just wanted to march and I was able to. And when we put these restrictions on the wristbands, what we say is all those kids who are fleeing their homes on Long Island to just try and figure it out, all those people who are new to the country and are trying to find an LGBT community, we say, you can only participate passively. You're not actually allowed to show your pride. You get to watch, and that's your participation. And I don't think that as a community, that is full participation. I think it does, it does us a disservice. And so what I would like to know is, <laughs> what I would like to know is why we decided, why HOP or whoever 
decided it was appropriate to limit the participation of, of community groups and limit the partic participation of anyone who would just like to jump into the parade, uh, specifically by instituting wristbands, and I want to know where that idea came from. And then following up on uh, the barricade question, I wanted to know why specifically we use interlocking metal barricades as opposed to soft barricades that people would be allowed to enter through. <laughs> My name is Bill Monahan. Um, I marched in my first parade in 1971, and I was scared. Uh, I wanted as much an anonymity as possible. Um, I wanted to be uh, left alone and to enjoy the day with other queer people. Um, I have had the police department put uh, cuffs on my hands more than a couple of dozen times and I don't wish to have a cuff on my hand whether it's a piece of paper or a, or a tie rack. That is so insulting. It is like being tattooed. It is like being less than. It is like being told you are, you are somewhat special you're a part, you're still the other, uh, you're not worthy. Uh, and I will not be wearing a band. Uh, I will be at the parade, and I will not be wearing a band, and you will not stop me from marching. number of people from your own community who are lined up to speak. Please be respectful. Questions, questions have been asked. We want to have time to answer those questions. I like that chant. I appreciated that. Um, my name is Viva Ruiz. I am an advocate working at the intersection of reproductive justice and queer justice. And for the first time, I have a float this year. I did a crowdsourcing because it's extremely expensive to participate. And uh, I have a float called Thank God for Abortion, and it's going to be great. So this is the thing. Um, the thing is... The wristband, the first thing are the wristbands. Now, having marched in Pride so many years, I grew up in Jamaica, Queens, in a community of black and brown people, and uh, my experience is that um, police made us unsafe. That's my experience. We did not look to the police to keep, uh, keep us safe. We ran. That's my experience. And um, when I heard about the wristbands, also in the last few years, since 9-11, you can see all, every, all the parades, all the protests be more and more policed. The Women's March a few months ago was time. You sat for an hour and you marched two blocks. So this is part of a greater problem of um, squashing dissent, of standing on us. This is part of that. So the last few years, the last few years, it's been so violent already to see what happens to the kids that want to hang out on the piers. We used to be able to march to the piers and celebrate on the piers where this movement started. So that ended, and it ended in a very violent way already. When I saw this wristband thing, here's what I said. You created a flashpoint. You created a flashpoint, a point of conflict. Another one. We didn't need more. It's already there. Now, for this year, for the first time, who's going to enforce the wristbands? People with guns. People with guns are going to enforce this. And so, okay, so that, so that, so I'm gonna ask you, my ask is, do away with that. Just rescind that, rethink it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Just don't do it. Hi, 
I'm Rolf, he, him. Hi, Brian. Hi, Carl. Deputy Commissioner, Assistant Commissioners. Uh, I've got a question, not really a speech, because I'm no good at speeches. Um, where are the strategic response group with their darkened uniforms, their tactical gear, their M4 assault rifles, their helmets? Are they going to be on, like, 21st Street again, uh, trying to threaten us? Uh, as, as a group, uh, or, you know, just so we know where to send the photographers and the legal observers. Uh, hello, my name is Colin Ashley. I'm with the Reclaim Pride Coalition. Uh, woo! Uh, I've also been an activist in the Black Lives Matter mov movement in this city. Uh, Black Lives Matter. Um, someone mentioned that they saw the NYPD as a civil institution. Uh, I want to be clear that the NYPD as a racist, sexist, transphobic, homophobic institution is a present threat to my life and to the life of my family and my community. Uh, they are an institution of terror to many in the city and in our community. Uh, but today, I want to be clear that HOP is complicit in that oppression, and HOP is complicit in my oppression. I think it is disgustingly hypocritical of HOP in this moment of increased state repression to name this pride defiantly different and to even talk about the anniversary of Stonewall while increasing these forms of policing that the most marginal in our community will face. <laughs> While it might be interesting to talk about the experiences of oppression that Gold faces in an oppressive institution, it's actually fundamentally important in this day and age to talk about the real forms of oppression that LGBTQ people of color, poor LGBTQ people, and trans and gender non-conforming members of our community face. The risk to their very lives often at the hands of police who have always been oppressors in our community. While I believe that HOP will lose this battle and that it's increasingly important for us as a community to fight back, to take back our parade that represents our battle for liberation, uh, I actually do have a question. Uh, we know that <laughs> We know that the policing on the piers and in the West Village on Pride Day itself uses barricades and policing as weapons directly against black and brown queer bodies. I want to know what has HOP ever done to prevent that policing on the piers and why should we have faith that you should handle the 50th anniversary of our struggle? Thomas Blewett with ACT UP New York, uh, founder of Queer Nation, Pink Panthers, uh, uh, one of the founders back then. Uh, segue to now. Um, a few years ago, down in the village where I used to live on 10th and Washington and had to move to high raised rents, in which now the penthouse sold for $34 million this year, um, the village was a place to come together. The subways are somewhat close, right? Sixth Avenue right there, it's a very gay pride associated um, subway stop. But a few years ago when I was seeing the lights on the Hudson River look at everybody taking romantic walks after the parade where everybody would funnel down to, there were police boats with bright lights shining on everyone, and I took videos because it was kind of fun. But they came up and they were flashing everybody, and that I just figured was just part of security post 9-11 especially. However, little did I know that was the last time we would ever be able to walk to the Hudson River. We would be able to go anywhere near the West Side Highway and that all the plans of the very, 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 very rich in the West West Village yeah. seem possibly to be taking over uh, in terms of what comes first to give both the NYPD and HOP directives. And that's what my concern is where all this might have been coming from in the first place. And there's a certain um, fact that when I came down to Greenwich Street, to Jane Street, to all the streets that have been home, were home so, for so long and still are, I'm a native New Yorker, you couldn't walk because you trip on all the barricades, but you couldn't even get to your friend over on the sidewalk. There was no ability to be together anymore, to not trip together anymore. And the only place to sit was on stoops. Oh, and gee, what a surprise, that causes trouble. So 
in the area of the nonviolent conflict resolution here, let's not cause the conditions that cause problems. And also, finally, this officer commander over here, you've since Occupy Wall Street done pickoffs. Everything might be going wonderfully, and then you and a team will, on Twitter or other social media now, especially, pick people off. You know, and I get that you're doing your job, but we're doing ours too. But you need to do your job better, like some of you are here to improve. Hi. I'm Ann Northrup. Uh, I've marched for many decades in the parade. I was a speaker at the Stonewall 25 parade uh, 24 years ago. I'm a veteran of ACT UP. I've been arrested many, many times in demonstrations, uh, convicted on four counts for the St. Patrick's Cathedral demonstration. <laughs> in part because a police officer lied about my conduct on the stand, blatantly sat there and lied about what he claimed to have seen me do. It was a lie. Uh, I have also gone into police precincts to do training on homosexuality, to make myself the local lesbian, to answer questions. <laughs> When I was doing this, I was working for the Hetrick Martin Institute. I, my job was to go around to local schools mostly and do these trainings. But I had a friend, Edgar Rodriguez, some of you may remember, who was a police officer, and he invited me and my colleagues into the precincts. I have to tell you, now this was a long time ago, but the police precincts and the police officers were the hardest people to talk to in the city. And I talked, I went to Canarsie, I went to the South Bronx, I went to drug programs on Staten Island, I talked to fourth graders, I talked to teenagers who bragged that they like to beat up fags on weekends in the village, but police officers were the toughest to deal with. Now, I say that in sorrow because I want us to all get along. Uh, and for us all to be happy and successful, but I'm just laying the groundwork of my experience. Uh, but I want to talk mostly to Hop. Uh, I do think we've lost the sense of this as a community event. I'm not interested in the corporation's participation. If, if they, if they want to support us, let them stand on the sidelines with big signs about their support. This march should be a community march of people, as the women's march was, not with little floats and contingents. The community should be allowed to get out into the street. And by allowed, I mean we should allow ourselves, not uh, the powers that be. Uh, I am, I, I mean, everyone has been so eloquent. I really applaud and echo everything everyone has said. Wristbands, forget it. Uh, I'm confused about the march route, um, and I'm confused about be it being a rehearsal for next year. Are you suggesting that next year this is going to be the route? No. no. Sir. Excuse me? Central Park. Central Park, definitely. Uh, let's remember that in uh, 1994, we marched up town on Fifth Avenue and First Avenue and filled both those streets to Central Park and had a huge rally there. We're certainly not going to do this on whatever little diddly route you've uh, laid out for this year. So I'm, uh, I'm out of the bars, off the sidewalks, into the streets, everybody welcome, uh, forget control, forget corporations, forget wristbands. Let's just all get out there. Uh, yeah. Hello, my name is Leo. I'm co-president at Rus LGBT. Look at this beautiful picture. Do you see immigrants here? Do you see someone who represents queer immigrant community who came to the, New York, in the United States being persecuted in their own countries? 
first time when I uh, registered for Pride, and I was shocked that they limited marchers, and they said we are trying to be fair, but immigrant community, asylum seeker cannot afford pay additional 100 fucking dollars for every 20 people. And you are talking to me that you are supporting, where have, have you been when Trump is attacking immigration community? Where have you been when we are persecuted on the basis? Where have you been reaching us and asking us, do you want to join the conversation on immigration, on pride, or whatever. I've been with, in this business for 15 years. I survived violence in my country. I came not because I was intended to do so. And here I see corporation rising. So you put in the front row corporations, you put in the back community you are praising. But you are not the community, you are just commercialized pride. And that's why my personal belief in the future, you have to rename yourself. You are not New York City Pride. You are Manhattan Pride, you are Corporate Pride, and I believe that we have to put together and resist, and Rus LGBT has joined resistance contingent, and from the next year we are not going to participate in this hoax. <laughs> Okay, we are. We want to make sure we have enough time to answer everyone's questions. So we're going to stop the line at this point. So those of you who are online, you will speak. But at this point, we're going to stop the conversation and get some of the responses. Hey there, my name is Ken Kidd. My pronouns are he, him. Hey. Uh, I am a member of Rise and Resist. I'm a member of Gays Against Guns. I was a member of ACT UP. I was a member of Queer Nation. I still am at certain times. Uh, some of you all up here will remember that we negotiated pretty successfully for a resistance contingent last year. Uh, I want to speak to the past, and I want to speak to the present, and I want to speak to the future. And I want to speak specifically to Heritage of Pride. Uh, I also want to echo the fact that I believe that having a, a, the theme of defiantly different and then putting all these layers and layers of restrictions and the way that you all have negotiated in such poor faith is just an abomination. I really cannot tell you how horrible it makes me feel because I know for a fact, even in the slides that you showed tonight about, oh, and we've been working on this new pride route and you had a date of January 22nd, 2017. I was at that meeting. I was there to start to negotiate with you all about last year. At no point did this stupid, small, rinky-dink route that has no bearing on our heritage of pride, I might add. It's a march to nowhere. You know, I'm glad that it goes past the, the AIDS memorial. That's great. But, and I also want to say, just with reg regard to the good faith negotiations and the, or the lack thereof, the fact that this meeting is happening right now at the beginning of June, when you all are at the busiest point when you all have put this off, when you've refused to have meetings, when you all have canceled meetings with these very people who have come to represent different points of view, does not speak well for transparency and does not speak well for why we should trust you. All of these things are of a piece. All of these things are reasons why we are, not we're demanding, we're also begging as members of the same community that you honor the heritage of pride that is our heritage of pride, that the march, that the parade, that the dance, that Pride Island does not own. It's not a registered trademark. This is our culture. This is our history, and this is our future. To a lot of people in this country and to a lot of people around the world who come to these events, this is the shot at freedom and the inspiration that they are looking for. And it is not about Walmart. It is not about Target. And I also want to say, and I know I've got to go, as we plan for next year, and I mean we, because I fully intend on being there to talk about how we can improve this route and how we can improve wh which avenue we're going to wind up on. Right now, the, the resistance finally won and got a contingent in the march. Let me finish. ABC stops its coverage at 3 p.m. 
What time does the resistance line up? 3 p.m. So, the, so, 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 what this will look like to the nationwide audience is not unlike the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, which was referenced tonight. This is not a cavalcade of products. This is not an infomercial for folks. This is not what you need to buy in order to be a good gay. I, Hi, um, my name is Bella, my pronouns are she and her, um, and I super recently joined up with Reclaim Claim Pride Coalition, I don't know if I could claim I'm with them, but they're awesome. Um, so, my point is, um, for a long time, I've been, ever since I've come out, I've been going to this parade, and one thing I've always noticed when I go with my trans friends of color is, is like, whenever uniformed police go by, they freeze up. It's a community they're usually very afraid of. Um, I was born here, I'm a Bronx native, I was born to refugee parents from the Soviet Union, and the one thing I found even when I was in school upstate was that I was the president of the LGBT, um, LGBT group on campus. I had also trans friends of color come up to me afraid to come out about sexual assaults <coughs> on them because they were so scared of interacting with police officers. Um, so I guess my question is, I believe you yourself said something to the effect of other cops tolerate us. It's not a full acceptance, not yet. And I guess my question is, um, if it's not really acceptance, how do you expect populations much more vulnerable than yourself to feel? when uh, people are walking by in uniform. You know, you have a lot more privilege than some other people in this community who are not officers, so how would they feel seeing you in uniform? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hi, my name is Michael. My pronouns are him, his. Um, I actually just came to know this organization through my best friend, Bella, who just spoke. Um, and I just wanted to voice a couple of um, concerns. I'm new at this, so please. Um, uh, so just like growing up, everybody in this room who identifies as LGBTQIA um, knows that when you're growing up, you have to like maintain a certain posture. You have to maintain a certain walk. You have to make sure that people don't suspect anything. You have to make sure that nobody kind of expects anything from you. Um, and I know that as you go toward more and more marginal groups, especially people of color, queer people of color, trans women of color, people are always kind of checking themselves and rechecking themselves and pride is the one opportunity where a lot of people who aren't out, who don't have the opportunity to be out if they don't have the resources that other people have the privilege to have, they can finally kind of celebrate themselves without any sort of restrictions and without worrying about it. And to know that there's such a heavy heavy, suffocating corporate presence at Pride, to know that the last, last year when I went, I noticed that there were significantly fewer corporate floats earlier in the day when I went, and I'm pretty sure this is true. And then I thought about it in the back of my head, and I thought, well, the tragedy of Pulse just transpired, and it's still in everybody's recent memory, and perhaps a corporate presence wouldn't necessarily bode well for Pride. And I don't think that it necessarily needs a tragedy further in history or a tragedy to occur for a corporate presence to be, hmm, perhaps we shouldn't necessarily be such a heavy presence of this parade, a heavy presence of this march, a heavy presence of this rally. So that's all I wanted to say. Hi, my name is Michael Bullock, and um, I also want to speak to the corporate presence in Pride. I um, started to come to Pride in 2000, and I never really identified with what the Pride Parade ha had become at that point, and I'm still confused about what it is now. Um, and I think that, um, I think the relationship between corporations and what Pride is needs to be rethought. I mean, I think that when you go to a parade and all the money on the floats is only uh, corporations that can afford it and all the community uh, people that that built this community that what we're actually celebrating can't afford to have the same floats I think that I think that the organizi organizers of pride need to ask the corporations to sponsor community or like I think the relationship between money interests and the community interests should be aligned in a completely different way than what I see happen in the pride over the last few years I think that there's there's the pride parade should celebrate our history and our creativity I mean, why aren't there Keith Haring float balloons that uh, Citibank pays for? Well, I think that there could be a list of creative ideas 
and we could ask for the corporations to sponsor those ideas instead of letting them do what they want. I think, I think the, I'm not against corporations. Corporations fought for gay merit. You know, there's a lot of corporations that were on our side in a lot of these fights. And I think that the, I just think that the alignment, giving the whole parade over to them is not what we need to do. And I think that it could work in a much, much more creative way that works out better for everyone. I think the parade could be more intelligent, more informative, more beautiful. Um, if the money was was arranged different in a different way. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Priya Nair. I use they, them, and also she, her pronouns. And I am the LGBT liaison for the speaker, Corey Johnson. Um, and he he did want to express his frustration. He wanted to be here, but he is stuck in budget negotiations. And he does feel very upset about the route um, and did talk to Heritage of Pride about the route. And I think everyone is committed to looking at the route for next year and making sure that the community is more involved from the beginning of that process. And you know, I'm taking very diligent notes in the back, and you're welcome to come talk to me. I'm in a green tie, and I'm also, you know, a queer and trans person of color. And I'm so sorry that, you know, everyone has not been heard in this process. And thank you all for being here. Just your quick hand. Yep. Uh, sorry, Alex. He him. Uh, back again. Uh, so just two things, um, really quick. So as Ken mentioned, that the 3 p.m. start off time for the resistant contingent that we had to win by publicly shaming Hop by holding a town hall first that preceded this one by a full, what, two weeks? Um, is exactly why this, oh, a month, I'm sorry, is exactly why this meeting is happening after a succession of meetings that Hop also canceled, sometimes day of, as we have been coordinating with them since actually, Jake can tell you, January, where we were asked to have things in line by May, which we were going to have. So I want to preempt them before they take the opportunity to get back on the microphone and mischaracterize things again. Um, also, the mischaracterization of the idea that we are the prejudicial parties because we don't think of people of color that are going to be going back to Jackson Heights as included in our community, which is why we don't think about the parade route inclusivity, uh, was so incredibly inflammatory, so incredibly insulting, and honestly just beyond the pale, uh, especially in regards to who are on what sides of the table in this meeting right now. So I just really want to put a fine point on the fact that if you would like us to think that you speak in good faith to represent the community, that that is all you need to know to understand why we don't trust you. All right, now a number of questions have come up during this process. We're now going to answer your questions. And for that, I'm going to hand it over to Julian, who has been taking notes to make sure we get to everything. Thanks, Sue. Thank you, everybody, for the comments and the questions. Um, so some of these questions would need to be answered by um, NYPD and the mayor's office. And also, um, we will answer some of the more technical operational questions. So I'm going to allow both the mayor's office and NYPD to answer some of these questions. And then we will follow suit with some of the other questions you'd ask specifically for us. So I'll allow you all, any of you to go ahead and start answering some of these questions. No, there were a lot of there were a lot of questions, but the one thing that stood out for me, and, and I've had in conversations internally in the NYPD and with Heritage Pride, was the question about people who are disabled and being able to leave during the parade route. And it's my understanding, and I have people who can correct me if I'm wrong. At any intersection, if you want to leave the parade, you can. The problem is when you leave, you might not be able to come back. I'm sorry. Excuse me. Um, I'm sorry. 
I, I'm just, I have a request. I have a request. We heard all of your questions. We heard all of your comments. We, listen, I, I understand how you may feel about that, but allow them to speak. Please allow them to speak because otherwise we have until nine o'clock. So please allow them to answer. Thank you very much. Good evening. We designate, we designate on, on, on any event that we do uh, in patrol Road Manhattan South, especially to this scale. Uh, it's not every intersection that we allow people to cross. We do designate uh, areas, as in this parade, uh, I'm sorry, to march. Uh, we designate the, uh, the AIDS Memorial as an ADA location. Uh, as far as people crossing the street, we try to, we try to access certain streets for, cr for crossing, and that really just aids in the flow of the march. Participants that want to exit the parade can exit at any of the pedestrian crossings that are open. Sorry, just give us a few minutes. I'm passing the questions over to them. I took some notes. Yeah. You go ahead and answer those. No, it's not that. I'm trying. I'm looking at my notes. I can't look at somebody else's notes. I have to look at the notes I took. So there was a question about the parade route, right, and how the parade route came about. I took my position in July 6 of 2017, and when I took that position, uh, shortly after, there were discussions that happened between city agencies, city transportation, the NYPD, Heritage of Pride. I was invited to some of those meetings. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, but during those discussions, there were three different parade routes that were presented to the NYPD to look at and come back with feedback to Heritage of Pride. And out of those three, there was this one that was finally said would probably work best. And that's how that came about. Um, if I can just add on, actually there were six. So just so that everyone is aware in the room, this route was not one of our initial proposals. We, can I answer the question? So there are a few different proposals that we came up with based on our discussions with the community, uh, based on the committees that we had. Um, and we had a couple of those meetings all year long. We asked for feedback. We came out with different proposals. And we put together those proposals and we submitted them to NYPD. So we asked for their feedback. They recommended this because of specific reasons and those reasons I'd also shared with you. So after a lot of different discussions with different city agencies, not just NYPD, we all landed on trying this out. Some of the CB, um, there were a couple of CBs that were invited, the mayor's office was there, there were a lot of different agencies that, we that were also there. So um, you know, anyone else in, from NYPD can also speak to that, or even Matt from mayor's office can speak to that because you were there during the meeting. But this, was, this is what happened, so I just wanted to be very clear about the proposals. All right, so I'm just going to go ahead. I've, I've taken some notes, and I, I, I've noted all of your questions. And I'm just going to start answering in the order that, I, um, that you came in. So I, I just said I took a list of all of those questions. Let me answer them. If I didn't cover something, please, be by all means, stand up and tell me what I didn't answer. If that's fair? OK, great. Let's proceed then. So first, transportation to Pier 97. Um, one of you asked about transportation to Pier 97, and you mentioned that there's limited transportation options. There are actually four different bus options, and there's also three different subway options. And some of those stops can get you as close as possible to Pier 97, and you can walk the rest of the way to Pier 97. Um, second, why do we not consult the community? I understand a lot of you felt that we, you were not consulted. Could we have done a better job at it? Maybe, yes. We could have done a better job at it. I, I will apologize if we did not do a better job at consulting you. However, 
our committee meetings have always been public. Our general membership meetings have always been public. All right, so earlier on, I never made any noise when any of you spoke. I allowed you to speak. Let me answer. But let me answer what your questions were. If you allow me to speak, I can answer your questions. Now, every, you, last year, when a lot of you came to our meetings to negotiate, we opened the doors. We never said you cannot be there. You came to many of our meetings. You knew those were public, so you, you came for those meetings. And we had a lot of ongoing discussions. And we never said you should stop coming to any of our meetings because we clarified these meetings are public and anyone can attend and you can be there to speak. And in that spirit, we had been having ongoing discussions for many, many months. Now, moving forward, this March route at this point, it's so close. Yes, we understand there are some frustrations. However, we assure everyone in the room, we are planning to have multiple debriefing sessions. We've been working very closely with Corey Johnson's office. We've been working very closely with the mayor's office. We've heard a lot of you, and we will have debriefing sessions after the march is over so that we can hear a lot more of your feedback because next year is an important year for all of us. So we'll like to work together and hear your feedback. Um, next, Some, one, one of you commented on the seats at the front for NYPD. I just want to highlight some of them here will be answering certain questions, and that was, to be, that's, that was the reason why we wanted to make sure it was easy for them to just grab the microphone and speak. I did apologize if she felt offended that I asked if she could move to the other side, but I still wanted it to be at the front. But if you wanted to sit there, that's fine. But I also wanted to make sure that there was some space between community members and NYPD, and they were all not sitting. That was also an intention. I'm sorry that was taken the wrong way. Wristbands and limitation of part, uh, participation, uh, participation of marchers. Um, why can we do away with this? So I think I explained earlier, our march last year was, it ended at 9, 9.38 p.m. We have, I understand it may not be a concern to you. I understand it may not be a concern to you. I'm sorry, so let me try and answer this question. I understand a lot of you are concerned that this was very late. Okay, we're going to... We're going to ask you guys to be quiet. Let Julian get through it. There's a, a lot of people are emotionally invested. A lot of people feel very strongly. Take a deep breath. Let them get through the presentation just as they sat and let you get through your questions. I don't know that we're going to solve everything here tonight. But if we can't be heard, we won't get any closer. No wristbands, Julian. The whole room shouted out at you. Address that answer. I am answering that question right now before I was interrupted, so let me try continuing, uh, let me continue to answer that question. Um, so the wristbands and limitation of participation, one of the reasons this came about was because the march has gone on for very long. Last year, it was we finished at 9.38 p.m. The year before, we finished at 8.30. The year before that, we finished at 8 o'clock. I understand we could start early, but there's a lot of preparation that we need to do. We arrive at 4.30 to start setting things up. There are a lot of groups, there are a lot of vehicles that we need to consider and floats. This year, we have about 460 groups. And at this point, we have 43,000 marches. So there are a lot of preparations that preparation that goes into before we even step off. We also need to make sure that we have broadcast prepared. So there are a lot of things that goes into um, a lot of this consideration. Now, let's also keep in mind next year is a big year. We don't know how long that's going to, how long the march is going to be. Now, if we don't initiate some element of limitation now, we will probably be on the route for 14 hours next year. Let's keep in mind. <laughs> And, and uh, not everybody wants that. Not everybody wants that. Again, we can, we can talk about this. Let's talk about some of these ideas later on, especially when you have the debriefing session. Accessibility, accessibility of the route. I think earlier Carl mentioned that there was accessibility to the route.
unless I have a band on my wrist. So we have we have we have volunteers. We have volunteers at all intersections. Now the priority here we have made sure that the, vi the, vi the volunteers will be the main one to take care of all of this. NYPD officers will be there. They will be at the intersections. But it's not, their, it's not going to be their role. It's not they're going to be ro their role. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know, I do not envy Heritage of Pride's task in really trying to manage a lot of this event and the more than nine and a half hours and some of you are cheering and I get it, but I also know there are some people who, who don't want to stand for nine and a half hours and watch this event and there's some people who are at the last end of it who are waiting nine hours to march unhappy. So I don't envy what they have to do. Listen, well wait a minute. I do need to let you know because you asked a question earlier. I do want to answer your question if you give me a second. I do need you all to know that the NYPD is not in the business of enforcing wristbands, and our officers will not be there to do that. That is a heritage of pride limitation, and their marshals will be doing that. The NYPD is not going to be inspecting wristbands and limiting people. That is not our job. So you will not arrest me if I wear a wristband? You will not arrest me? No, I will not. Okay. So, so NYPD officers are only there if there is some form of violence in terms of physical violence, in fact, our volunteers have all been trained on de-escalation. We, in fact, worked specifically with ALP to have specific, you know, very specialized de-escalation training for people of color and other minorities as well. So we are a little bit more sensitized in the years past, so we have taken extra effort to make sure that we would be able to adhere to certain sensitivities that the community would have. Um, who worked on the march route? I explained that earlier. Um, I'm not able to leave the march. I think Carl answered that earlier. Um, there are a lot of exit points. You can leave that at any point. Corporate participation. There's been a lot of feedback about corporate participation. I think one of the key things to keep in mind here is a lot of these corporate, part uh, corporate organizations that participate have their LGBT employees that march. Um, predominantly, 80 to 90 percent who would be marching in these corporate organizations are LGBT um, employees of these companies. And I think we have to keep in mind that um, you know, LGBT individuals are everywhere, including corporate organizations. And we are not in the business to turning them away. Also, let's keep in mind that all six, between 65 to 70% of those who march and who are registered, the groups are nonprofits and are community groups, not corporate organizations. And let's keep in mind, this is a nine, in a, you know, nine hours and 38 minutes. One person could be there for 10 minutes and they could see two or three groups passing by that's corporate organization. And they may assume that every, all the groups are corporate organizations and that's not true. We have corporate organizations at certain parts of the group, but we have community organizations all over the march, including the first section. This year, section one is predominantly a people of color contingents. That doesn't mean that throughout the march we don't have other people of color contingents, but there are I'm just pointing out, we have community groups in section, section one this year too. So, we ha I, I mentioned earlier, we have um, 43,000 marchers. Because of the limitation that we have this year, um, we have about 65%. So you can do the math. 65% to 70% are I'm sorry, there are too many questions going on right now. Can I go through the questions first so that it's easier? That's exactly what I mentioned earlier. 65 to 70% are corporate. Sixty-five percent are corporate. Uh, sorry, are community groups and nonprofits. We have 460 groups. We have 460 groups this year. Let me just pull up the stats. I can give you the stats. Give me, give me a second, I'll give you the stats. So we have about 286 nonprofits. We have about uh, 57 corporations. So that's what we have right now. Um, we, have to, we had to limit the floats. Um, our floats are limited to 90 this year. Last year we had 120. 
we have limited our, our large vehicles, smaller vehicles. We reduce all of that significantly so that we will not um, you know, have a nine and a half hour march again this year. Um, now I'm going to move on. There are a lot of other questions you've asked and I want to make sure that I'm able to cover that. We only have another 11 minutes. Um, again, I have a lot more questions to cover. I want to cover that. Um, so when do we start working on the permitting? I mentioned earlier we started working on the new route as early as December 2016. Submission of permit happened after August 20, um, 2017 because we try and put our permits in by December and so that's around when we finalized. Uh, we wanted to put the permit in. However, because we were not too sure, um, we only got stuff confirmed on January 22nd. It's immediately after the confirmation of the route, we put in the permit application for that. Um, will the route be the same again next year? I mentioned earlier that we are going to have debriefing sessions. Based on this year's route and based on the experience that we have this year, if there are certain pain points, we will change. If there are more feedback about why this can happen and why this would need to be changed, we are open to ideas and suggestions. We are going to be working with a lot of different people, so I'm not promising that this will be the exact same route next year. Um, why were the meetings canceled? So there was a lot of feedback earlier about meetings being canceled. There was only two meetings that were canceled. One was a committee meeting. That was a committee meeting that we planned internally. When the meeting was canceled, we didn't know that some of them from RPC were attending. We didn't know that. However, we wanted to have a closed door round table meeting. We postponed that. We wanted to initially have a closed door with a few leaders only from RPC and ourselves. The reason why we postponed that was a few days before the meeting, we received the letter of demand. And I know in my conversation with a few of you, you expected answers during that round table, but we were not able to give answers at that point in time. So we decided this will be a better session to have a town hall where we can actually have it a public forum and everyone can ask ask questions and it will not be a closed door event. So I just wanted to make sure that I'm able to clarify that. Yes, the resistance is going to be at 3 p.m. Um, last year, I'd like to point out, we put you right in the lead. Now you're not, in the la you're not at the end. The resistance in section seven out of, out of 15 sections. Keep in mind, we have a lot of other marchers who have specific messages. We have trans individuals, we have elder LGBT individuals, we have um, younger, we have children, we have all sorts of people with different types of messaging who are also marching before and after you. We want to also prioritize we are giving enough coverage to everybody. We have to be fair to its everyone. There are 285 other nonprofits, and they all have other messages that they also want people to hear. So I think it's important that you keep in mind that you are in the middle of the route, uh, the middle of the march, um, you're not at the end. So we understand your messaging is important. We believe in your messaging. We know how it feels like to be sidelined by this administration. So that's why we're also trying to give you enough um, you know, visibility by allowing your groups to register this year. Um, now, Corey, I, I, have pretty much, I have pretty much covered whatever questions I can from Hop. There are a few more questions I would prefer NYPD to answer. Some of these questions I know you had were over policing, your safety concern with barricades, arrests of people of color, um, formal apology for Stonewall, yeah. not to have uniforms, <laughs> and policing at the pier. Now, I'm not, at, I'm not at liberty to answer all of these questions. I'm going to just turn that over to NYPD to be able to answer those questions. Good evening. Uh, I, I believe I answered the barricade situation before, but I'll answer it again. All right. You're welcome. We use the police barricades, and I classified that the Heritage of Pride uh, march is probably in the top four events that we do in Patrol Bar Manhattan South. With 2.2 million people, uh, that mirrors basically the 4th of July, that mirrors the New Year's Eve, as well as the Thanksgiving Day Parade. The same amount of cops that we use for the 4th of July, for the Thanksgiving Day Parade, and for Heritage of Pride is basically the same. So there is really no over-policing. It's just the Heritage of Pride. <coughs> the Heritage of Pride Parade is, is a very long route. And I'm sorry, the Heritage of Pride, the march. 
The march is a, it, the, the length of the march is very long. We put we we have police officers as we would as we would police any other event in New York City. There, we don't add extra police officers to to police this march. There are openings that the police officer at certain intersections can open if we had to get an emergency vehicle through for an aided case or for a fire run. Uh, but most of the barriers are along the curb line. This is 2.2 million people that attend this, this event. There's 45,000 marchers. There's residents that we have to be concerned about. There, there are businesses that we're concerned about. It's a long event. It goes nine hours and 28 minutes, I believe Julian said. The barricades assist us in just maintaining some type of security in case there was an emergency event. So you're, you're still in the answer, right? Why do you use those specific barricades? Those are the barricades that we have. Why don't you be honest? The real impetus, the short of the parade, came from the cops to save and police overtime costs. That's the short of all the parade that came from you to save money. That's the only reason. Okay, we have a few more questions, and then we're going to have to wrap up. Julian. Julian. All right, so um, besides the barricades, besides the barricades, I know there was a question about the formal apology for Stonewall. Would any of you like to take that? Would any of you like to talk to that? Wait a minute, don't laugh, I'm not afraid to speak. <laughs> but uh, in all seriousness, I did um, have a discussion with the senior brass and with the police commissioner uh, about this request and about the sensitivity and about what's been going on in other cities. I can't speak for the commissioner because he'll make his decision when he does that and he will publicly make his announcement or whether it'll be in public or in writing or however he decides he wants to handle that. So those discussions have happened. You have to understand the police department doesn't always move so quickly. So I in my position have taken that seriously. So I can tell you that. But I do know there has been there has been some public apologies. I don't know if you, Deputy Inspector Seymour Pine, who, who actually ran that um, raid on Stonewall that night, he participated in, in a community forum and he was part of a book and he came out and publicly apologized for his role in that and the department's role and the homophobia. Since then, we had Commissioner Bratton who made some public comments about it also and how proud he was of how the department has progressed. So there have been some comments, but what I can tell you, uh, I'm trying to answer, so I'm, I'm being honest too, so yes I am. So a, uh, I have discussed this particular request with the commissioner. I don't know when, if, and how he's going to respond. That's not up to me, 
but I have taken it to him, and uh, there have been some comments in the past. So thank you, guys. Julian, you would have asked the president if you could acknowledge bringing a gay pride march yesterday. Yeah. Because more yeah. more would require that this is me to be in the front of the crowd. Yeah. Um, there are two other questions um, about uniforms. I know there's a lot of question about uniforms. Um, I think this is because Gold will be marching this year. It's best that probably Brian specifically answers this question. I'm sorry, I, I should answer the question as to, to where the resistance should march? No. 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 Oh, okay. <laughs> About the uniform. Okay, I, I've, been, I, I, I've, I've been very, very clear on that, um, and I'm on the record. Yes, I have. Um, I can email you the, uh, the Gay City News article that Duncan Osborne wrote, that people risked their personal safety to found this organization, met under the threat of imminent attack, under a bomb threat, that's how much that people did not want this organization to start. They fought for 15 years. When they marched on Fifth Avenue in their t-shirts as goal, the cops turned their backs, the horses turned their backs, so the horses' asses were facing all of them. Their personal property, was destroyed, their lockers were turned over, and they went all the way to federal court to get the same right that every other group inside the police department has. What do you want? What, what do you want? Uh, this isn't. This isn't. This isn't. I'm working to change an oppressive institution, Callan. Yes. Yes. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Time out, time out. No, 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 no. I'm a queer, you're a queer. Let's, let's talk queer to queer for a few seconds. Okay. Well, then, well, then it's clear to me. No, 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 no. Then it's clear to me. It's clear to me. It's clear to me that there are people here that don't want to engage in dialogue, that don't want a discussion, that don't. No, 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 no. It's not. That's not. That's not. No, that's not. That's not a dialogue. That's not a conversation. Brandon, I've sat with you. I sat with you in Brooklyn. It took six months of everybody talking about meeting with me, meeting with Goal. Since I've been the president of Goal in January 1st, 2016, is when I can accept responsibility for. And I have said publicly many times in many places, and my remarks are written, and we will gladly release them. That I believe that communities of color have been left behind, not just by the institution of policing, but by many elements and people in our own community. I've said that publicly. I've said it in police headquarters with the executive staff sitting right in front of me. Okay? I'm not done. I want to speak from my heart. I'm not sitting up here with any kind of prepared remarks. I'm going to talk about what, what Brian feels, okay, as a queer, and what I feel my role and responsibility is, and, and what I'd like to do. And I'm sorry. I am sorry to the people in this room, and this city, and this nation that feel that the criminal justice system has left them behind. And that the criminal justice system is not for them. I get it. I get it. I get it. And I support, I support Black Lives Matter. But I don't believe that the police are the only institutions that need to change. I believe corporate America needs to change. I believe, Jay, I get it. But I also, what I'm trying to clarify here is like what you said before, 
about that you appreciate me being out there and making sure that Gays Against Guns and that Rise and Resist is treated with decency and respect and they're not gonna be manhandled by people and told that this isn't a place for you to demonstrate, you have to demonstrate here, yeah, because I check with the legal bureau and I make sure that your rights are protected. But you see, the thing is, the thing is, is that I would do that for any group here. I would do that for any group in this room. The Gay Officers Action League would do that. We have a website, we have email addresses, we have a hotline, and we do get calls from people. We get calls from people that are afraid to go into a police precinct to make a report. Because the perception in 2018, and this is what really upsets me, is that the perception is that people think that when they walk into a precinct or they call the police for service, they think that what the cop is gonna say is, well, of course you got robbed. You met this guy on the internet on an app and he came into your house to have sex with you and you got robbed? What, are you stupid? That's what the perception is. I work to change that perception. I work to make sure that police and criminal justice professionals are adequately trained to treat people with compassion and respect. I cannot take ownership for the actions of everybody that wears a uniform. Because our rights are not protected. Our protest rights are constantly, the cops lie to us, they tell us you can't be here, um, they arrest people for no cops. reason, yeah. so you can deal with the cops. Forget about the corporations, your responsibility is to stop the police oppression and you're not doing it. Okay, Mark, that's, that's a fair point, but let me ask you something. Why is it this is the first time that we're having a conversation? Why haven't you reached out to me? This is the first time that I've been in the same room with you, and that's, unfor that's unfortunate. That's unfortunate. I was invited to participate. With queer cops. With queer cops. And the organizers also... I think about it every day. I think about it when I wake up in the morning. I think about it when I go to bed. And anybody that knows me knows that. And these people, my job, yes. I will not. I will not. Dishonor Charlie Cochran and Sam Chacon by taking off those uniforms. All right, thank you, thank you, Brian. I'm going to keep moving. I have one more question here, which was about policing at the pier. Jake, thank you for the feedback. Now, Jake, we will, we will have ongoing conversations. We will have ongoing conversations. However, I need to respect it's already 10 minutes past nine.
being pink washed with a rainbow flag around them, and you're going to make the more privileged people in our community feel like the police are safe and they're for me. But you aren't. As an organization, your unions are actively advocating, politicizing oppression of communities of color. And that's not what comes through. And so if you take off the uniform, that changes that perception completely. Yeah. And my concern is that that message isn't coming through. So if there's any sincerity in your words, please take that to heart. That that pinkwashing is dangerous for the most marginalized people in our communities. All right. Now there's one last question for the producing at, at the pier. I'm just going to allow them to answer their question. They would be able to answer their question uh, better than I would, so go for it. Which, which question? Will you open the pier? The <laughs> Carl, do you want to talk about the pier, or do you want me to talk about just, it? It's very simple. The NYPD does not police the pier. It's the Hudson um, Park Reserve. How about Christopher Street? Christopher Street. Christopher Street, Street. Christopher Street is going to be open. Christopher Street is barricaded off. Nobody can go on it. Will you? Christopher Street, as has been the case for 50 years, will you reopen Christopher Street? Christopher Street's open. No, last year there were barriers. You, 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 you asked if Christopher Street's going to be open. It's going to be year. open west of 7th Avenue, west of Bleecker. Thank you. West of Bleecker. West of Bleecker. All right. <laughs> That's going towards New Jersey. All right. We are over time. I'd like to... Uh, End this town hall by thanking everyone who came and spoke out and shared your thoughts. I'd like to thank our panel, and we look forward to continuing the dialogue. Thank you very much.